Hi, everybody, and welcome to our latest installment of our series of Hangouts with Sigma Xi's Distinguished Lecturers. This uh, particular Hangout is being hosted by the University of North Dakota chapter, so thank you all very much. Hi to everybody in that chapter. Please be sure to submit your questions during our talk. There's a, uh, uh, a question submission box on the right side of your screen. You can also tweet us questions or submit them on the main page of this event. So today we're very pleased to have Herman Sintim, who is at Purdue University, and he is going to talk to us about um, issues of bacterial uh, antibiotic resistance and biofilms, and uh, we are very pleased to have this talk with you today. So thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Great. Um, I did also want to mention to people who are Sigma Xi members that after this discussion, if you have any follow-up questions, you can go to Sigma Xi's online communities called The Lab. There is a discussion forum set up for this particular talk, and you can submit questions there that we'll get to Dr. Sintim. So if you have any thoughts after the talk, please do get them to us. So uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, issues related to antibiotic resistance. Um, so I wondered if we could just sort of generally start out and talk about the resistance problem. It's quite widespread. I wondered if people, you could give people a sense of just how big a deal it is. Okay, so um, I will first start by defining what antibiotic resistance is, and then, then I will then go ahead and, and talk about the scale of the problem. Uh, so usually bacterial infections are treated with uh, molecules and the majority of these molecules actually kill the bacteria. Uh, resistance is said to occur when the dose of the drug that is used doesn't work anymore and there are several reasons why those doses don't work. Some could be that the bacteria has developed molecular mechanisms that actually make the drug ineffective. By and large, um, most bacteria that cause disease are susceptible to the drugs that are used against them. However, some percentage of bacteria would have mechanisms to actually make those drugs ineffective. And it turns out that they also have the ability to pass on the know-how to make these drugs ineffective to other bacteria. And so that makes it quite problematic that it only takes one bacteria to acquire resistance for that bacteria to pass that knowledge to other bacteria for them also to become resistant. In terms of the scale of the problem, it depends on the type of bacteria. So most people have heard of methicillin resistance staph infections. Uh, that is quite problematic. A uh, few thousand people uh, per year actually die from staph infections every year in the U.S. alone. Um, there is also other examples like vancomycin resistance stuff uh, and, 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 and fluoroquinoline and, and almost any antibiotic that has been introduced into clinical practice has met resistance at some stage. Okay. So um, when you're, you, I wonder if we could get a little bit more into the actual mechanism of resistance or a typical mechanism of resistance. I mean, because we're talking about something probably on the subcellular level. I wondered if you could give people an example of what um, might be happening to prevent a, a drug from working. Okay, so I, I will first start by giving, by giving an analogy of someone coming into your home that who is unwelcomed. And so the, the, the easiest way to to get rid of that person is to grab that person and then throw them out of the door, okay? Uh, bacteria use that tactic in the sense that they have uh, proteins that are called efflux proteins uh, that are membrane bound. And so what happens is that when the drug gets into the bacteria cell, uh, these proteins are very promiscuous. They bind to uh, drugs uh, and then they pump those drugs out of the cell to the outside. And so that is, in my mind, that is the simplest kind of resistance, just the overexpression of these efflux pumps. Um, there are other resistance mechanisms, for example. So uh, penicillins and the beta-lactams are commonly used antibiotics. 
uh, they work mainly via a covalent inhibition. And so what uh, bacteria has come up with is to actually come up with an enzyme that then degrades the molecule that is supposed to, to work on, on those uh, 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 bacteria targets. And so these are, these are two very common molecular uh, mechanisms that bacteria actually use to, to become resistant to several drugs. So is it the case with these uh, resistant bacteria that there was some segment of the population that always had these abilities and they've just become dominant because the other segment of the population has been killed off by the drug? Or is there a way for bacteria to kind of develop these resistance mechanisms over exposure? Oh, that, that's an excellent question. So it, it's, uh, it's actually um, both scenarios. Um, there are some bacteria that do have a resistance genes. Sometimes these genes are found on uh, circular DNA called plasmids. Um, and so once antibiotic pressure is put on a population, the non-resistant ones will die off and then the resistance ones would actually overpopulate. Okay, so that is one way that the entire population becomes resistant. Uh, but there is a second mode of resistance and that actually occurs via random mutation. And so our genetic material, our DNA, is copied by enzymes. These enzymes have very high accuracy, but once in a while they do make mistakes. And so during that error process, some bacteria can also become resistant, especially if that error occurred on the molecular target that a drug is actually working on. And so there is spontaneous mutation that leads to resistance. And there is also some resistance that are acquired because some of these plasmids are already in the population. So in that case, it's just kind of a lucky break that they get that the mutation happens to be something that's beneficial rather than damaging? That's correct, yes, that is correct. Right, yeah. okay. Um, so um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about why this topic interests you amongst all of the things that you could be studying. Why is this sort of important to you? Yeah, so I actually started my career um, being interested in, uh, in the fundamental aspect of cellular communication. Um, and and it, was, it was during the course of my research that I started to look into the scale of the problem. Um, and I would say that I was almost forced to look into the scale of the problem because every time that we write a grant, one has to justify whilst we are, we are studying a certain phenomena. And so uh, the more I read about a problem, uh, the more I realized that this is almost like a, a, a time bomb that if we don't tackle, it's actually going to explode in our, in our, in our face. Uh, currently, only a small percentage of clinical cases are due to resistant bacteria, but there has been some projections that if newer drugs are not developed against these resistant bacteria that already exist, by the year 2050, death from antimicrobial resistant bacteria could actually even surpass death from cancer. And so this is this is a this is a big problem, but it would even become a bigger problem in future if we don't put in place mechanisms to come up with, with newer drugs to actually deal with this resistant issue. Right. Um, so uh, I wondered if uh, you could kind of comment a little bit about uh, the reasons for the rise in resistance. I think people have been uh, at least made sort of to feel like it's a little bit of hubris, like we've overused these drugs in places that we shouldn't have or that uh, people have been prescribed drugs when they didn't really need them or that they haven't taken them properly, so they've left uh, bacteria around that are resistant. I wondered if you could talk about that contribution to the problem. Yes, yeah, so it is it's actually all of the above that you said. Um, the misuse of antibiotics is certainly has certainly contributed to the resistance uh, of phenomena. Um, modern life depends on modern farming methods uh, or modern animal husbandry. And so a lot of antibiotics are actually used in farming and 
that leads to some resistance because whenever any pressure is put on bacteria, um, the bacteria will come up with resistance. Even if that resistance gene is not in a population, just random mutation could lead to resistance. And so one can then extrapolate that the more one uses these antibiotics, uh, the higher the propensity for resistance to emerge. Um, it has also been argued that uh, antibiotics are overused. Um, they are also misused. Uh, there are some patients who do not go through the entire course of actually taking the antibiotics. And so the effect of that is that the bacteria that do not get killed then would become resistant to that particular drug that was taken. Um, but having said that, resistance does not only emerge or doesn't only arise due to the misuse or the overuse of antibiotics. Uh, several years ago, um, there was a finding uh, where a research group found that some bacteria that were preserved um, in the northern Arctic actually had vancomycin resistant genes in them, right? And so this, this shows that resistance is actually an ancient mechanism. Now we gotta realize that bacteria fight amongst each other, they compete with each other, and so some of these resistant genes came about not necessarily because of, of the clinical use of antibiotics, but because bacteria use these molecules in, in, in fighting uh, amongst themselves. So some are Asian mechanisms, uh, but we have certainly helped in propagating these resistant genes, certainly, yeah. Well, it would make sense, I think, that there would be some um, inherent resistance within uh, bacteria because a lot of the substances we've used historically as antibiotics probably had uh, at least a, a basis in, in natural substances which bacteria may have already been exposed to in the environment. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. That is correct. Yes. So um, I wondered if you could talk about uh, some of your research and I, I gather that one of the, your research areas is trying to find sort of alternate targets for attacking bacteria that are maybe not uh, sort of standard places people would normally use antibiotics to attack bacteria. Could you talk about that? Okay, yes, please. So um, I, I would, I would want to start off by, by quoting a very famous quote attributed to Einstein. So Einstein once said that, at least that is what is being, is being, is being mentioned, that it is only the crazy person who will do the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome, okay? So if we look at history, we can see that whenever an antibiotic was introduced into the clinic, it only took maybe a couple of years for resistant strains to emerge in the clinic. And we have already discussed the different mechanisms where resistance actually emerges. Some of them are via random mutation. Now, what happens is that when bacteria becomes resistant, the non-resistant bacteria will die off, and so the resistant ones would actually take over the population. So I think that we now have so much data to accept that if we develop any molecule that affects the viability of bacteria, a resistance strain would emerge, okay? Um, so if we follow, or if we get inspired by what Einstein doesn't want us to become, to become crazy, then it means that we do have to have an alternative way of actually dealing with bacteria. Now, I am encouraged by the fact that there are over 200 different bacteria species that lives in our gut. And the majority of them do not kill us. It turns out that the majority of them are actually beneficial to us. And it turns out that we have learned to live with bacteria and bacteria have learned to live amongst each other because different cell types communicate amongst themselves. So cell to cell communication is very important. And so the new paradigm is to come out with a strategy that would actually stop bacteria from producing, you know, the toxins, the virulence factors that actually make us ill, 
without killing bacteria, right? So the idea is that if if such pressure is not put on bacteria, then there will be no evolutionary pressure for the bacteria to develop resistance, right? Because the resistance actually emerges from the non-resistant ones dying and the resistant one actually surviving. And about a few decades ago, especially in the 70s, uh, a very interesting discovery was made that bacteria actually communicate with each other or talk to each other if one may use uh, the phrase of, uh, uh, you know, some kind of a language vocabulary. And it turns out that this type of communication where bacteria use small molecules is responsible for the expression of so many toxic genes. So immediately it becomes clear that if one can find a means to stop bacteria from communicating with small molecules, then the expression of these toxic genes would at least be reduced. Okay, so this is what this is what is being termed quorum sensing. It has also been um, sort of shown in several studies that bacteria in the biofilm state, and maybe before I continue, I want to define what a biofilm state is. So a bacteria can exist as a free floating organism that is called a planktonic state, whereas it can also adhere to surfaces and form like community of bacteria, and that is the biofilm state. Now, I like to um, refer to the biofilm state as like a fortified castle, right, where bacteria get in there and protect the cells that are embedded in the biofilm with several matrices like proteins and DNA. The effect of this is that when bacteria get into the biofilm state, they are between 1,000 to 10,000 times more resistant to antibiotics, okay? And so I've now explained two different scenarios. One is communication amongst bacteria using small molecules that then lead to the expression of toxic genes. So if we can develop small molecules that will block these processes, then hopefully these toxic genes that do make us ill will not be produced by bacteria. The second is that if bacteria are more resistant in the biofilm state, then maybe if we can also get them out of the biofilm state, then we would, we would be able to make them more susceptible to the current antibiotics that we have. Now, to the best of my knowledge, there is no drug currently being used in a clinic that actually tackles the biofilm state of bacteria. And one of the reasons is that until recently, we didn't really know or we didn't really understand the molecular details that leads to bacteria biofilm formation. It's just in the last few decades that we are beginning to realize that quorum sensing, cyclic dinucleotide signaling, and some other signaling actually lead to the biofilm state. And so my research interest is not only to understand these processes, but also to discover small molecules that can be used to regulate these processes with the hope that some of these small molecules could be used as a next generation antibiotics with different modes of action. So these are not necessarily going to kill bacteria, but they're actually changing the lifestyle of bacteria where we change their, their, their mode of whether they get attached to surfaces or whether they actually produce these, these uh, toxins. Right, okay, so um, just for, to clarify one thing for people who may not be as familiar, um, we kind of jumped a little bit from the quorum sensing and the signaling to the biofilms. Those are actually connected things. Um, mm -hmm. the, the bacteria are kind of communicating with each other and sensing each other in the environment in order to link up and kind of create these biofilms. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. And the communication is actually enhanced in a biofilm state because in a biofilm state, bacteria are actually in an, in a, in an enclosed environment. And so the mm -hmm. communication among them is, is actually enhanced in the biofilm state. Right, so when they get into this sort of sensing each other in this biofilm state, they are actually kind of working together in a way, almost like a super organism. They're, they're coordinating their activities as well as signaling each other. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So it has, it has been mentioned that one should actually look at a biofilm almost like a specialized, almost like a tissue, right? Where they do come together and then, and then they function together just like you would get with cells in a tissue. 
Right. And one other thing I want to make sure people are aware of is uh, biofilms, I think, are not just a, a problem within, say, human systems, but they're also a problem on surfaces, uh, places that need to be sterilized but aren't because of the resistance of these films to destruction by standard substances. Is that correct? That that is absolutely correct. So they are not only they are not only problematic in medical settings. One can even imagine, um, you know, biofilms formed almost everywhere: rivers, lakes. Um, you know, the Navy has issues with biofilms. Every time that any solid object is put in water, bacteria will coat the surface of that object. Um, biofilms can be found in pipes that actually you know deliver water to our homes and. Some biofilms can form to the extent that they might even block pipes. Okay, so they are they are important almost everywhere, not just in the clinical setting. Right, and so I I think we should also make clear um, this is not something that's happened recently because of antibiotic resistance or anything. This is a natural state that bacteria have been, and I think we're just more cognizant of it than we used to be. Is that correct? Absolutely. It it has even been mentioned that the biofilm state is the natural state of bacteria, right? And, and the planktonic state is just a, a temporary state where they have to get to that state in order to move to another location. But most of the time, bacteria actually live in the biofilm state. It, it's really interesting that uh, the first observation of a bacteria was actually a biofilm bacteria. And then, you know, scientists spent decades developing drugs against free floating bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> when even the first observation was a biofilm bacteria. Yes. Um, I just want to mention to people watching, um, we did tweet out a link to a, a past article we had on biofilms in case people want to look at that and get a little bit more information um, after the talk. But um, the other question I had was, so you're saying this is kind of the natural state for bacteria. So do, do all bacteria form biofilms or is it a certain percentage of bacteria? It has been estimated at about 80% of bacteria form biofilm. The numbers sort of change, but it is a very high number of bacteria that forms biofilm, mm -hmm. especially the ones that are of clinical relevance. Yes. And so the film itself, um, you're saying is kind of like a fortified castle. So um, it's it sort of, uh, is it proteins they're releasing that kind of, you know, not to use too uh, colloquial term, but you know, it's kind of gunk that they're coating themselves with that's protecting them from the environment? Yeah, so it is, it is, um, it's made up of different uh, macromolecules, uh, polysaccharides, proteins, even some DNAs are found in biofilms. They are basically matrices that um, uh, form like you can call them gun, but they are, they, it's not, it's not like just one entity, it's a mixture. And depending on the type of bacteria, the matrix would also be different. So alginate, for example, is very common in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, which is uh, an opportunistic bacteria that that uh, causes a lot of uh, hardship, especially with, for patients who have cystic fibrosis. Uh, so yes, yeah, so it depends on the type of bacteria, but usually it's proteins, polysaccharides, DNA um, are the main constituents of the matrix that form the biofilm. Can you talk about some of the bacteria that we know of that cause diseases such as tuberculosis and how that's related to their biofilm state? So Pseudomonas is, is a classic one that, that forms biofilms. Um, it usually forms biofilms in the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, e. coli is, is another bacteria that also forms biofilms. So uh, typically um, when patients have any kind of artificial indwelling, um, these bacteria will form biofilms. Staphylococcus also forms biofilms. So you have gram negative being E. coli and pseudomonas, uh, staph being gram positive also forms biofilms. Uh, biofilm with TB is an interesting case because TB is an intracellular pathogen. And so there has been some debate about the relevance of TB biofilm. Um, but typically when we are talking about dispersal of biofilms, it's, it's mainly um, relevant to the extracellular bacteria. 
uh, and not necessarily the intracellular ones. So does the immune system respond differently to bacteria that are within a biofilm? Absolutely. So um, the immune system would have an easier time dealing with bacteria that is planktonic than that is, bi that is in a biofilm state. Because if, if you have a bacteria in a biofilm state, the majority of the bacteria are actually protected, right? It's, it's gonna be very difficult for the immune system to get inside the biofilm and actually deal, deal with the bacteria. The only ones that are probably going to be exposed would be the bacteria that are on the surface of the biofilm. So, so, so there, there are instances where the immune system would be able to deal with those bacteria on the surface, but by and large, it's going to be difficult for the immune system to actually get into the inside of a biofilm and actually deal with that bacteria. Is the immune system still able to detect the bacteria? Does it protect them from detection at all? Or is that something that the immune system can pick up on even if it's within that coating? Yeah. Well, so the, there are different, there are different there are different um, components of the immune system. Um, the immune system has evolved to be able to detect not only a whole bacteria, bacteria, but also components of, of bacteria. So for example, LPS, it's something that, that can be recognized by the immune system. And most of the time, it actually leads to overstimulation of the immune system. Um, certain components like uh, cyclic dinucleotides in bacteria can also activate the immune system. Um, there are certain proteins um, on bacteria that would also be recognized. There could be antibodies against those. So there are different parts of the bacteria that the immune system would be able to recognize. But there is difference between recognizing a problem and clearing the problem. And so if you have bacteria in a biofilm, um, the surface would have some of these bacteria that would then present some of these features that the immune system can recognize. But after that is recognized and the immune system is activated, the next question is that how easy is it for the immune system to be actually to get inside the, the biofilm to then deal with the bacteria? And that is where the problem comes. And so there has to be ways for the biofilm to be dissolved by other ways, for the bacteria to be exposed before the immune system would be able to probably engulf the bacteria and then you know get rid of the bacteria or, or, or use other mechanisms to get rid of the bacteria. So, uh, so let's go back to the signaling pathways that you were talking about. And uh, can we talk about some of the specific ones that you're trying to target? Okay, so um, they, they this, this, the quorum sensing um, pathways that we are currently looking at, we are looking at, um, we are actually looking at two pathways. One is called the autoinducer two pathway, um, which has been dubbed the so-called universal signaling pathway, uh, the structure of the molecules that are involved in this pathway uh, were elucidated by uh, Professor Bonnie Basler at Princeton University. And since then, there has been some controversy whether it is a bona fide signaling molecule or whether it's just a metabolic waste. Um, and so we have spent the last decade actually using organic chemistry to, to make synthetic analogs of this signaling molecule called autoinducer auto 2. And we have shown that some of our synthetic analogs can compete with the natural autoinducer in binding to the receptors. And we have also shown that some of our synthetic analogs can have effects that are opposite to what a natural autoinducer does. And so there's been examples where the natural autoinducer would cause biofilm formation in an E. coli. And we have shown that when we make synthetic analogs that are different but not that different, we actually make molecules that dissolve the biofilms of E. coli. We have then collaborated with other groups and shown that our molecules are actually binding to the same receptors to the natural, to the natural uh, uh, autoinducer. However, when our molecules bind to those receptors, they cause a different conformational change. And that is the reason why we have a different, a different outcome. Um, 
We've also recently started looking at another hormone sensing pathway called autoinducer one. Uh, autoinducer one is made up of homocyrene lactones. Uh, it's typically used by gram negative bacteria. And the problem with homocyrene lactones is that they are unstable. And so recently we actually made synthetic analogs that are more stable than the natural ones. And we have shown that our synthetic analogs are also, are also effective. And so our strategy is to, is to actually look at a natural signaling molecule and then use the power of organic chemistry to make synthetic analogs that are similar yet different. And we have shown, and not only us, but other groups have also shown that this is a very good strategy to find molecules that can compete with the natural molecules and occasionally they do have a different outcome to, to, the, to the signaling molecule. So how are you actually getting the substitute signaling molecules into the system? Well, so we, once the molecules are made, we, we just treat the molecules like drugs because they are small molecules and so they, they, can, they can freely diffuse anywhere. Yes, we treat them like drugs. And so the biofilm doesn't impede the pathway of that particular signaling molecule? Is it sort of a Trojan horse kind of situation where it recognizes it as one of its own sort of thing? Well, that's, that is a great question. So some of, some of the synthetic molecules are recognized as one of, one of the natural ones, like the natural ones, and some of the synthetic ones actually make the biofilms worse. Uh, and then there are also some that, that, that have the opposite effect. And so what, what organic chemistry, the power of organic chemistry, that it allows us to make you know, libraries of molecules and then once we screen for their properties, we are able to identify ones that have the desirable properties that we want. So yes, absolutely. So um, you're saying you're screening libraries of these. Does that mean that you're sort of creating these uh, substitute signaling uh, molecules in simulation before you're actually synthesizing them? Well, we use, we use two different approaches. Um, if the signaling pathway has been elucidated, and if the proteins that are involved in the pathways have been well characterized by structural biologists, then we can use computational docking methods to identify molecules that would be able to bind to these and inhibit them. So we have used that. Sometimes these receptors are known, but due to technical difficulties, their structures would not have been solved. And so then it makes it very difficult to sort of design um, antagonists in a rational way. And so then what we then do is that we look at the natural signaling molecule. And because we know that the natural signaling molecules bind to these receptors, we make the assumption that if we make analogs that look like the natural molecule, some, of, some part of the analog would also bind. And then we then use just traditional chemistry to make different variants of it. And I would say that that is almost like shooting in the dark, right? We make so many different variants that because they are so different, when we then test them, we do find that some of them actually uh, do, do cause antagonism. Uh, there was an instance where, when we were working with autoinducer 2, uh, the receptor for auto inducer 2, the crystal structure had not been solved. And so we made synthetic analogs without using structure to guide us. And then after we made a synthetic analogs, we use our synthetic analogs to actually solve the crystal structure of our analogs bound to the auto inducer. And now we could now use that information to now design the next generation in, an, in a rational manner. So it's almost like an iterative process. Sometimes we use random to, to get our first leaves, and then we then use that for structure, and then we then do rational design for, for the next generations that are more potent. So it sounds like you have the ability to create a lot of variants sort of in parallel so that you can kind of speed up this trial and error process. Is that? Uh, something you can do chemically is to create multiple variants of these uh, substitute agonists? That is absolutely correct. So uh, in the last few decades, uh, synthetic organic chemistry has developed to the extent that we can literally make thousands of molecules that are different. 
and 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 that allows us to explore what we call chemical space. So yes, absolutely right. So I'm sure that must make this a much more feasible research area if you're able to to do that many uh, sort of uh, screenings all at once. That's correct too. Yes, yes. Yeah. So what you mentioned before, though, about the autoinducers and those those particular signaling molecules is, uh, I think they're unusual in that they're not species specific. Uh, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so autoinducer two is not species specific, uh, whereas autoinducer one tend to be species specific. That's absolutely correct. Um, they they have when when one is developing inhibitors of these processes. Uh, they each have the advantages and disadvantages. So, for example, if there is a signaling molecule that is not species specific, it means that if one comes up with an antagonist, then that antagonist is also going to affect the beneficial bacteria in our guts. And, and the beneficial bacteria also do very important things for us. Uh, and so, uh, the, 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 the wisdom in going after uh, a species non-specific signaling is still not being clarified and we hope that the molecules that we generate in future would actually help us to to settle this one way or the other okay um, the species specific ones are interesting because then one could actually target a specific bacterium but here too there are immense challenges because most of the time, the difference between a pathogenic bacteria and a, a non-pathogenic bacteria is only a plasmid. So for example, if you have a pathogenic E. coli, for example, E. hec, the difference between that and a non-pathogenic one might not actually reside in the communicating molecules that they use. And so, so there are also challenges in just, in just going for the species-specific um, um, quorum sense. And, and this, sort of uh, illustrates the huge challenge that we all face in dealing with bacterial infections. Right, so you're, you're trying to reduce any collateral damage you have while still developing something that I guess will give you a little bit more return on your investment in a way because that way if you have something that's not species specific you can use it on multiple organisms, is that the idea? That is the idea, yes, yes. But at the same time, you want to make sure it's not impacting beneficial bacteria at the same time. That's correct. That is correct, yes. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty naughty yeah. problem. <laughs> it, is, it is not very clear whether we would be able to, not just us, but the whole community would be able to actually achieve this goal, right? How do you just <laughs> stop the, only the bad ones and leave everyone else? <laughs> Right. Yeah. yeah. This is this is kind of the same problem I guess people have with um, cancer research in that you're trying to target only cancerous cells and leave the you know the regular healthy cells alone at the same time. That is correct. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's interesting that that targeting is such a hot topic in cancer research, but in a way you're trying to balance that also with I guess research pressures at the same time. At the same time, and and you know with with bacteria, I mean the the issue is. Is sort of confounded by the fact that in nature it's very rare to find what we call a monoculture. So what I mean by monoculture is that you know you don't find E. coli just on its own. Typically, bacteria are associated with other bacteria, and so even if you find a means to stop, you know, one species from producing the 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 matrices that actually. Uh, help them form biofilms. The other bacteria that they are they are forming co-cultures with might be producing those matrices, and so they might just come for the ride. <laughs> so it is it is it is it is it is really a, a big challenge. Yeah, it, yeah, it. I think we sort of have an oversimplified view of the biological world in that way, in that we think that if we're being you know subjected to a you know some kind of illness, it's just from one bacteria at a time, when in fact it's probably more likely to be multiple actors all at the same time. That is correct. That is correct, yes. There, there is actually imagine um, sort of somehow consensus that some of the illnesses um, 
also arise from the bad bacteria, making the good ones become bad actors, right? And so they, they sort of influence each other and that all contributes to the whole uh, disease state. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, um, I've heard people talk about the fact that um, beneficial bacteria, if you change something in the environment, it might sort of set them off in a way that's not beneficial. So you don't want to kill them all off because they, you still need them, but you need them to go back to what they were doing before. So it's not really a case of killing the bacteria, but changing the situation that they're in. That is correct. Yes. Yes, that is correct. Um, so you're saying that um, part of what you're working on is, in, in essence, creating substitute molecules that will attach to the receptors and interrupt the original signal without actually killing off the bacteria. Is that the way that um, all of these signaling agonists work? They all attach to specific receptors or are there multiple mechanisms? Well, so the, the majority of signaling molecules um, Will, will bind to some receptors, but the types of receptors that they bind to are different. And so, for example, there are some receptors that are on the cell surface, and once they bind to these signaling molecules, they then become activated. So there are some receptors that have, let's say, kinase activities, but their kinase activities, or what I mean by kinase act, act, activities that they can put phosphate groups on, on other molecules, uh, are only turned on when they, they are bound to, to these signaling molecules. Um, and so in that way, the signaling molecule will bind to a receptor which is very remote, and that receptor gets turned on, and that receptor then affects another another macromolecule and that macromolecule affects another one so it becomes almost like a relay system and it ultimately leads to uh, the activation or the deactivation of what we call transcriptional factors or, or repressors that, that, that regulate which genes are turned on and off. There are some signaling molecules that actually bind directly to these transcriptional factors and so there, there are multiple mechanisms that, that are used in these bacterial communication systems. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, if uh, if the question here is to sort of reduce bacterial resistance, um, I'm wondering if uh, resistance to these kinds of uh, signal disruptors is possible as well. Oh yes, great question. And people have been debating this for years. So, the central premise is that resistance arises from pressure being put on bacteria, right? So whenever bacteria has to survive, then molecular mechanisms that actually alleviate the, the stress would be activated. And the argument has always been that since these signaling or communication networks do not affect bacterial viability, then resistance to them should be lower. In other words, Communication is a group of behavior. And so if a bacterium develops resistance, they are actually put at a disadvantage because they, become, they get out of sync with the, with, with, with the group. And so they then will not benefit from the effects of being part of a group. But there has been instances where people have shown that there are mutant bacteria that do not respond to these signaling molecules, but then they coexist with bacteria that do respond. And so in a way they are called the social cheaters, right? Where they, they themselves are resistant to the signaling molecules and, and then antagonists. But as long as there are others in the community who can respond to it, then they can benefit from, from, that, from, from that system. And so then one could argue that if social cheaters are possible, then if there is a scenario where the ones that are responding to the signaling are then wiped out, then you then end up with a group of bacteria that are resistant. And so it would be foolhardy to actually assume that the quorum sensing inhibition approach will not lead to resistance. <laughs> the, what we are hoping is that it will decrease the propensity for resistance, but it will not completely eliminate resistance. 
Right, okay. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you test out uh, some of your test molecules um, uh, in uh, microfluidic flow cells and things like that, sort of in, in an in vitro environment rather than in vivo. In vivo, okay. So um, bacterial communication, uh, as I've already said, lead to biofilm formation. And, and biofilm is very easy to, to observe. Um, one can actually stain a biofilm with certain fluorescent dyes and use all kinds of microscopy to image these biofilms. And so when we make a molecule that inhibits these communications, then these molecules are also going to inhibit the biofilm formation. And so when we grow bacteria under these microfluidic um, um, platforms, we can basically grow the bacteria without our molecules and observe how the biofilms form. And then we can then do another experiment where we now add our molecules and then also observe how the biofilms form and then compare the two. And typically if the molecules are working, then it would be, we would then be able to conclude that our molecules are inhibiting the biofilms via the communication because we would have done other experiments to actually show that the molecules also inhibit communication. Um, another experiment that we typically do is to actually use uh, uh, an engineered bacteria that only responds to signaling molecules. So earlier I did mention that signaling molecules affect transcription factors and repressors. And so if we have a, uh, for example, if we have a green fluorescent protein that is only made in the, in the presence of an activated transcription factor. And if that transcription factor is being controlled by a signaling molecule, then we can now add our molecules and see how that green fluorescent protein is made. Right? And that would be an indirect way of, of inferring that our molecules are actually interfering with the signaling. Right, yeah. okay. So, um, I think I, I was looking in some of your research that you've actually um, looking at other ways of disrupting biofilms as well. Am I correct in that you're also looking at electrical fields? That that is absolutely correct. So that that is in in collaboration with a very good former colleague of mine at the University of Maryland, Riza Gotsi, um, where he has been interested in using electrical fields to dislodge bacteria. And, and others have also been looking at this phenomena. The, it, 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 it has been noted by several others that electricity can be used to dislodge bacteria, although the exact molecular details as to how this happens is still a hotly debated, de debated subject. And so we have been interested in combining the effect of this bioelectricity effect with our, with our signaling inhibitors. And working with RISA, we have actually shown that these two strategies are complementary to each other and they actually synergize each other. Um, the, the ultimate goal is to combine these with our signaling molecules in instances where a patient has an implantable device where one can actually send electrical signals to that implantable device and then that patient probably also takes an anti-quorum sensing, you know, drug, so to say, and then those two phenomena will synergize with each other to prevent biofilm formation on that device, right? Because biofilm formation on implantable device is a huge uh, problem in, in, in clinical settings. I see. So the purpose of the electrical field in this sense is to sort of break up the biofilm? Is it? That is it that is correct, yes, is to break up the biofilm, yes. Uh -huh. that is correct. Yep. And so you're basically getting them out of the fortified castle so they're more susceptible to whatever you're trying to target them with? Whatever. Yes, yes. And it has, so it has been shown that once, once you dislodge the bacteria from the biofilm, then even traditional antibiotics work because the, bio, the antibiotics can then get to the bacteria. Right, I see, okay. Um, but if you're still working with resistant bacteria, you might need to work with a different targeting mechanism. That is also absolutely correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Um, so we've only got a, a few more minutes left here. So I wondered if we could kind of just uh, branch out a little bit and talk about some more general concepts uh, in science. I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, the cross-disciplinary nature of your work, if there are people you work with that are sort of not in your main area and how that affects your ability to make new discoveries? Okay, yeah, so um, so far I, 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 was, I was trained as an organic chemist for my PhD and then I did chemical biology for my postdoc. So there was a little bit of biochemistry in what I did. Uh, but I didn't have a formal training in, you know, how to make microfluidic devices. And as you can see from some of my publications, I have actually done some work on microfluidics. And so this is where collaboration has really helped me. Uh, so in the last few years, I have worked with electrical engineers. I have worked with um, bioengineers. So Riza Gotzi at University uh, of Maryland College Park. William Bentley at the University of Maryland College Park. These are engineers that I have worked with. And, and by collaborating with them, they have allowed my group to actually test the effects of my molecules in a more sort of complicated environment. Um, so that is one example where a chemist or a biochemist can actually work with an engineer to, to look at an important scientific problem uh, recently, I also worked with a structural biologist. So we had a signaling molecule that was showing very interesting properties. And we didn't, we didn't, we wanted to have an insight into the molecular details of how that was actually affecting certain receptors. Um, but my group doesn't have the capability to solve crystal structures. And so in this instance, I worked with a crystallographer uh, in Korea and we solved um, uh, the structure of a quorum sensing receptor bound to our synthetic molecule. Okay, so that is also another example of working with someone who wasn't formally trained in my discipline. Um, I also have another collaborator who is a microbiologist. So Vincent Lee at the University of Maryland is a microbiologist. And I didn't talk about our work in cyclic dinucleotide signaling, but we are also interested in that. That is also involved in bacteria biofilms. And so I've also been working with Vincent Lee to look at cyclic dinucleotide signaling. And so I've, I've just given an example where an organic chemist or biochemist has worked with a microbiologist, a structural biologist, a bioengineer. But what actually brings us together is that we are all passionate about bacteria. It's just that we are bringing different tools to the problem. And in all the papers that I have published, each team would not have been able to accomplish the totality of those papers on their own. So we needed everyone to sort of bring their expertise and insights to actually make, make it work. Now, to answer your other question, what I realize is that whenever I collaborate with someone, after that collaboration, I have a different perspective on how to tackle the problem. Because during a collaboration, you know, people usually give different opinions, different ideas. And so I see that as an extension of training, that even though I didn't, my PhD and my postdoc didn't involve microbiology because I collaborated with Vincent Lee, it's almost like I got the training that he got <laughs> because during that, during that collaborative process, he gave me insights about bacteria. So that is, that is the, the great part of our colla colla collaboration is that it's an extension of, of, of training. Right. Um, we've had a question come in from the audience that I, I'd like to relay to you. Uh, it's, is there any significant work being done to cultivating microbiomes that protect the host? In other words, protect against, protect against destructive infections, uh, using symbiotic or neutral bacteria to act as defenders of a particular host. Oh, okay. That is, that is, that is a great question. So the, the answer is yes. Um, the, there is a practice called fecal implant um, where certain bacteria are actually implanted into some patients and the idea is that these bacteria are actually helpful bacteria okay um, there are some bacteria they, there are some um, um, uh, bacteria that are referred to as probiotics that people buy from stores right so these are all um, our beneficial bacteria that 
that are actually taken to, to sort of almost help reestablish beneficial bacteria in people. Recently, it has also been commented on that there are differences between babies who are born via C-section and babies who are born naturally. And one of the arguments is that their, their microbiomes are different because the beneficial bacteria, depending on how a baby is born, will depend on the, on the route of, 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 of delivery. And so there has been some suggestions that some of those babies would then have to be smeared with beneficial bacteria. So, so as a simple um, uh, answer to the question, yes, there is research being done on beneficial bacteria and how they can reestablish colonies that are actually beneficial to people. Right. The, the uh, question asker sent a follow-up that just says that fecal transplants are very useful in dealing with C. difficile, as an example. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, just in the last couple of minutes we had, uh, I wondered if you could talk about being someone who comes from an international background, uh, if you found that uh, having diversity in the teams that you're working with in terms of backgrounds uh, has been helpful in uh, creating uh, more useful research, for instance? Yes, so d different backgrounds always create different ways of looking at a problem. And when a problem is looked at from different directions, then the opportunity to have discovery also increases. And our different backgrounds, the way our different upbringings actually allow us to look at problems differently. And so, and so what, I, what I do find is that uh, when I have people from you know, different places, different backgrounds, not, it's not only places, but even different neighborhoods. Um, and if, when we, whenever we brainstorm, the solutions are very different. And so we end up with, with, with a more diverse set of solutions to go for. Uh, and it has been very enriching to lead a group that is very international. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we have a lot of uh, graduate students who are in Sigma Xi, and uh, we always like to ask speakers if they have any advice for graduate students for surviving the PhD postdoc process, any sort of general uh, things you always tell your students that are good things to do. Yeah, so, you know, I always tell my students that you would have to look at your PhD not as a job, but as a passion. And once you look at it as a passion and not a job, then it becomes very rewarding. The other advice that I always give to my PhD is this, that never do an experiment and hoping for a particular result. Because whenever you do that, you are going to probably miss out on a Nobel winning, winning research. It's usually the unexpected that are, that are more rewarding at the end. And then finally, even if you do an experiment and it fails, you have not failed because you have actually added to the scientific body of knowledge that that kind of experiment should not be done by someone else. And so that is still an important addition to scientific literature. Right, that makes sense. I wish there were more ways of publishing negative results. It's a big yeah. debate in science right now. Yes, yes. Um, also, I wondered if you could weigh in um, on something that uh, comes up a lot, I think, for people who are working in sort of the modern environment. People tend to collaborate and communicate more over um, virtual uh, networks, you know, just like we are doing now when we're talking to each other. Do you feel that talking to people in, over email and other means electronically uh, is uh, an effective way of collaborating or do you feel like you need in-person collaboration first to set up relationships? I'm wondering about your experience in those areas. A lot of scientists have different opinions about that. Yeah, so I, I have had both and both have worked. Um, so the majority of my collaboration started when I was at University of Maryland. And because he was in person, we, we built relationships over the years. And, and after I moved to Purdue, we have still continued our, 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 our collaboration. And now we use Skype to, to, to communicate emails. 
Uh, and then I've also had a few where it actually started off by emailing each other and then using Skype. And then over time, we then met in person. So what I have found is that irrespective of how it starts, it always helps if occasionally the scientists meet in person rather than conduct everything virtually forever. But as long as occasionally people meet in person, then, then I, I haven't found any problem doing, doing virtual kind of collaborations. Yeah, I think that's an artifact of human nature as much as it is of the scientific research process. That is absolutely correct, yes. 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 Okay, so we're just about out of time here, but we had one last question come in from the audience. I'll just ask you this one before we go. Uh, is there any work being done to use bacteriophage viral agents as that can aid in protecting the probiotic microbiota? So bacteriophage, that is, that is a great question. Yes, there, there are actually many research groups who are now looking at bacteriophages because you know bacteriophages are the natural enemies of bacteria. And so one, one can imagine that that bacteriophages could be used um, uh, against bacteria. And they don't usually have the same kind of resistance as small molecules, although there are also some resistance to bacteriophages. Bacteria actually do have ways of stopping phage from inf infections, like, for example, destroying their tRNA so that there is no infection during the infection process. Um, so yes, there, there, there is room for bacteriophages and, and my prediction is that we are going to see great advances in bacteriophage technology. But having said that though, there is, there is a potential limitations for the use of bacteriophages and that always goes back to delivery. Small molecules have the great advantage of going anywhere, whereas non-small molecules sometimes have the whole delivery issue. That, that affect, but yes, bacteria figures are good. Great, okay, thank you. Okay, so we're out of time, so we're gonna have to leave it there. So let me just again thank the University of South Dakota branch of Sigma Xi, uh, chapter of Sigma Xi for uh, hosting this discussion today. We hope you've all enjoyed it. And thank you very much to Dr. Herman Sintim of Purdue for joining us and for sharing your research with us. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye. Okay, bye.